All right, welcome, welcome. Uh, thanks for coming to this symposium towards responsible biomedical AI. Uh, thanks for joining here at Penn State or online by Zoom. Uh, we're happy to have you. Uh, my name is Jennifer Wagner and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you here today. I want to begin just by taking a brief moment to thank and acknowledge people who have been involved in this project that led to the symposium and also in putting all the details together for it. Um, so I want to thank uh, Alex Bui. So Dr. Alex Bui is at UCLA. He is the Director of Medical and Imaging Informatics, um, as well as the Director of UCLA's Bridge to AI uh, Coordination Center that's called Building Bridges, Coordinating Standards, Diversity, and Ethics to Advance Biomedical AI. Um, the Bridge to AI initiative, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a major effort by the NIH Common Fund um, that's designed to really uh, accelerate and advance the development and widespread adoption of AI in biomedical research. Uh, the Bridge to AI initiative involves uh, collaboration and coordination across several uh, data generation projects, uh, as well as coordination centers uh, that have different cores, including one of them a as an LC core. Uh, Alex approached me a while back and, and uh, said, you know, what if we would have a supplemental project to a repository that he had been working on uh, that's called Premier, uh, the Predictive Model Index and Exchange Repository. Uh, and those conversations really led us to this point. Um, so Alex's recognition of the importance of LC or ethical, legal, and social implications research uh, and his willingness to engage us uh, here at Penn State as part of that, that process, I think is, is something to be appreciated and acknowledged. Um, it's been really a pleasure working with him as well as his postdoc, Anders Garlid, um, who and, and both of them unfortunately couldn't join us here, here today, and I guess I'm making them wake up early on the West Coast with this 9 a.m. East Coast start. Um, but I know they're excited for the symposium. I know they're excited to see what comes out of uh, the work that we've all been putting into this for the past year. Um, I want to acknowledge the hard work of those collaborators on this project as well. So Laura Cabrera, Sarah Gurka, and, and Daniel Susser have been my colleagues on this. Um, they've assisted with the empirical research and, and convening the meetings that we've been having with an, an amazing academic work group, and I'm so thrilled to have the members of that working group here today. Um, you'll hear from them about their research uh, and get glimpses of, of the insights that we've been uh, fortunate to hear over the past year uh, in this space. So we've been having critical discussions about everything from synthetic data to LC-focused computational checklists, role of IRB, everything in between. Uh, and so I do want to say just at the outset thank you to uh, Glenn Cohen, uh, Meg Dower, Jordan Harrod, Kristen Costick quinnett Jasmine McNeely, Michelle Meyer, Nicholson Price, and Daniel Schiff. Um, several students have been engaged in this project from time to time, helping us with literature, helping us with, um, with various tasks, including Alex Howe, Khalid Smith, Samiksha Kator, and Morgan Schnars. Uh, and then behind the scenes assistance for this symposium today, I do want to give a, a, a shout out and thank you to administrative folks here in the School of Engineering, Design and Innovation at Penn State, um, Lori Dots, Jill Blonsky, uh, and Denise Olivet, uh, as well as Lance Lobinger for helping us with the IT um, and all of those things. And then Judy Maloney and Betsy Van Noy at Rock Ethics Institute for assisting us with travel coordination. Um, the symposium itself was made possible with generous funding support from the National Institutes of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering and the NIH Office of the Director. Uh, and we also had support from uh, the Law Policy and Engineering Initiative here at Penn State and the Rock Ethics Institute. Um, we have a lot to get through, and I know we started a couple minutes late, so I'm just going to uh, get us to the main event, right? Get us to the talks, which is why we're, we're here. Uh, so we've structured our time together uh, to fit as, as much as possible into these few short hours. Um, if you haven't grabbed one already, for those of you in the room, there are programs that have the, the agenda outlined for you. Um, we aren't going to do individual speaker invitate like uh, introductions uh, we would be here all day uh, <laughs> just talking about the amazing things that the speakers have done um, but I do invite you to look at their uh, bios in the in the program 
and in the informa information sheet that we provided with the webinar information. Um, we are going to have a keynote address to start us off. We'll then have a session of speakers uh, who will give short talks followed by a moderated discussion. We'll take a quick break come back for session two, which again will be a group of speakers and moderated discussion. We'll take one more short break between sessions, and then session three will be three more speakers uh, and a moderated discussion. So there will be opportunity for you to ask questions and engage the speakers and, and one another during that moderated discussion. So uh, if you need pen and paper, we have extras here for you. Uh, or hold your questions and we'll, we'll try to get around the room. Uh, we'll also try to moderate questions that are coming into us by the participants who are online. Uh, so feel free uh, to submit your questions there. Uh, and now I have the pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, so I am very pleased and thrilled to introduce Neil Richards. Uh, he is the director of the Cordell Institute for Policy and Medicine and Law at Washington University, St. Louis. Um, he's also the Koch Distinguished Professor in Law there. Uh, he is one of the world's leading experts on privacy law, information law, and freedom of expression. Uh, he's written um, several books. Uh, so the most recent is Why Privacy Matters, which is one I, I like quite a bit and use in my classes, actually. Uh, he joined academia uh, about 20 years ago, if my information is correct, and before that served as a law clerk to Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice William Rehnquist and also Judge Paul Neimeyer of the US, uh, sorry, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, and he practiced appellate litigation and privacy law with the firm of Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering in Washington, D.C. Uh, he serves on the future, the board of the Future Privacy Forum uh, and um, is a member of the American Law Institute. Uh, he just does amazing, amazing work. I am thrilled that he was able to travel to State College uh, here this morning. Uh, and today he's going to present Responsible Biomedical AI from Half Measures to Loyalty. So without further ado, Neil, the floor is yours. And I will fast forward through the slides that I didn't use. All right, because we're, we're casting, right? So yeah. excellent. All right, so great. Um, so now my hands are full. Um, it, it's actually, was, it was totally easy to get here. Uh, it was. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember that the, the, when, when Jen invited me to, to come to, to State College, which I keep thinking is also called College Station because those places live, live together in my head, even though they're like, you, they could, could be more different. Um, I was like, that sounds amazing. I've never been to Penn State. And then I was like, how on earth do I get there? <laughs> and where is it? Um, though I live in St. Louis, so people say that to me a lot when I invite people as well. So I want to talk to you um, today about uh, some work that we've been doing at the Cordell Institute. This is not entirely my own work. I've been collaborating um, with three colleagues in particular. Um, the, gen the genesis from this came from work that I've been doing with my friend and frequent co-author Woody Hartsog at BU um, for most of the last decade on questions of consent and loyalty and trust and uh, originally centered around privacy, but of course many of the, I'm setting off the automatic uh, uh, door alarm, so I'm gonna stand over here. Um, uh, originally, uh, originating in privacy, but but one thing we've realized is many of the things we have learned in what used to be called, before I did it, cyber law, and then privacy law and information law um, over the last 20 years are, are tools and techniques and, and lessons and um, we, we believe insight um, that is helpful to AI in general and to, to questions like uh, biomedical AI in in particular. Um, I should also credit um, one of our fellows at the Cordell Institute, Jordan Francis, who helped us with a letter to NIST um, about AI half measure we did in June, and our new policy director at the, at the Institute, Ryan Durry, who joined us about six weeks ago and I don't think has slept since, um, and actually gave a version of this talk yesterday at Washu Medical School. Okay, so this is the possibility, right? We have this, this idea of a range of technologies, a range of techniques, a range of tools um, in the biomedical space broadly defined um, that can help people, that can promote health, can promote wellness, 
can drive science, can support physicians and researchers and, and a whole host of other people uh, in the pursuit of their professions and jobs, which if we want to be charitable is helping people live better, healthier, fuller, more flourishing lives. Um, that's the dream. Um, but there's also a possibility that, that things might not go the way. I should also add that AI created these images. Um, uh, it, I guess it knew what it was talking about. Um, there's this, the, AI is potentially harmful, right? There are ways in which technologies can be built or in which technologies can be deployed, right? Which are two very different complementary and important things that could cause harm misdiagnosis, manipulation, the, the, the bias, um, uh, making problems worse rather than making problems better. At the same time, we could have really great biomedical AI. It could be ethically and responsibly deployed with, with appropriate legal guardrails around it, but if people are still terrified by it, if the, if, whether it is researchers or physicians or patients or other groups, we might still not get to deploy it so that our, our, our dream of the, the happy blue doctor um, might get replaced by the, 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 the nightmare in people's minds of the, of the terrifying red doctor. Um, and we wouldn't get the outcomes, we wouldn't get the, the, the policy, the consequences that we want. So, so and I, I think there's a, uh, perhaps our, the, the, the font changed here, so hopefully this, this, will, this will work. Uh, I wanna make three claims this morning. Um, first, irresponsible AI threatens real harm. Second, many current solutions, many of the ways in which we, in the academic discourse, but also in policy discourse, have thought to grapple with AI and, and, and to harness it. Uh, many of these current solutions are in fact half measures. They create the illusion of doing something, but they do not tackle the broader problem as a whole. They will not solve the problem, even if we add up all of our half measures. I'm a, I'm a theorist, not a quant, so I realize that two halves do make a whole, but in this case, maybe they're not even half measures, maybe they're just uh, quarter measures or eighth measures, or uh, th th they don't add up to a, to a whole solution. Um, and I wanna offer a solution which is trustworthy AI in the biomedical sphere and beyond and how we get there. All right, so, so I wanna start, the, you guys liked the pictures of the robots. I, I, I liked making them. Um, but I want to start with a cautionary note, which is that AI is not a person, right? We, we often tend to essentialize AI um, as if it is this, this sentient thing, right? Like the robot that puts Luke's hand on at the, back, at the end of Empire Strikes Back. Uh, spoilers, right? Um, I, I assume you've seen this film. Um, it's useful to talk that way, even, even those of us who know better that AI is not sentient, that AI does not e exercise agency. We do talk this way f out of convenience, but it's important particularly for the next 40 minutes or 35 minutes or how, however long we're, we're gonna be doing this, um, that you don't take me as essentializing AI or anthropomorphizing AI and that, we do, and that we continue not to do it ourselves. But unfortunately, the way our language is constructed, it's easier to talk that way than to say the technologies that AI uh, represents, et cetera, et cetera. So AI is a technology used by entities to advance their purposes, right? It is a tool like a hammer or a knife or a truck or a gun or a computer. In fact, it is a computer. Um, so when we think of AI, we should not think of this guy, um, though it is hard for us not to sometimes, nor should we, from blue doctor to red doctor, think of this guy. Um, we should think of this guy, um, Sam Altman, the, the, the CEO of OpenAI, we should think of the humans who are behind the creation, the development, the sale, the adjustment, the deployment of these technologies. In, in, in com as, as STS folks would say, in complex socio-technical systems. So, real harms, half measures, solution. So let's talk about some of these harms. I wanna say that there are four uh, problems with AI, we can we can carry. There are, there are more, but I want to talk about four today. Um, that AI is hungry, sneaky, leaky, and risky. Okay, what what do I mean by that? Well, AI is is hungry. Um, AI is uh, 
uh, and again, right, the people who are developing the technologies of AI in accordance with their purposes, which are sometimes to help people, but almost always to make money, um, have developed technologies that are hungry for data, that are hungry for data about people, that are hungry for sensitive, sometimes, data about people, and hungry for data that is, to some extent, protected by existing spheres of privacy and data protection law, um, HIPAA being the most relevant to, to this audience, but and the GDPR and others, um, but not always perfect. Um, and and often that data is outside of these of these of these frameworks. Um, and so, what do we do with that? Second problem with AI is that it's sneaky. Um, when you're encountering an AI system, um, I have to say. AI did really well here. Um, that uh, that that uh, I, I you know may, maybe it was hallucinating. I'm I'm not sure. But but AI is sneaky. AI when we're interacting with with a chatbot, we're interacting with a with an AI diagnostic device, with a um, with a customer service representative, with a physician, a telemedicine person. Um, we don't always know that we're dealing with AI. Similarly, we always don't know if our data is being collected. By AI or what it is being used for, right? There's a lot of talk about about black boxes, but sometimes we don't even know there's a box, um, and that's another problem uh, with not just with with the technology, but with building social trust in this range of uh, the the subset of these technologies um, that are universally good or on balance amazing. Um, AI is sneaky. AI is also leaky. Um, the the data that is that is built into learning models to other forms of AI um, often gets uh, exited. Right. Sometimes the companies that use that collect the data to train models use it for other things. So think about facial recognition training models, for for, for example. Um, other times, the AI itself there was a story uh, will will leak the data. There's a story in the in in the BBC uh, earlier this year. Uh, about, um, I think there were there were patient transcripts, perhaps involving uh, psychotherapy, um, which were used to train the model, and were then being repeated by the model as outputs, um, and that's and that's problematic. Um, uh, Apple, I believe, has stopped its its. Uh, uh, employees from using learning models and using generative AI because of the concern that trade secrets might get swept up into the models uh, if it is used to, you know, uh, please write me a talk to give us a keynote at a NIH funded event, right? The, I if there's trade secrets in the talk, there's, there's no trade secrets in, in this talk, um, they can then get bound up and they can leak out at unexpected and inappropriate times. And finally, AI is risky. Um, right, there are a number of, of well-documented, well-discussed problems with AI from um, uh, racial and other forms of bias to the use of AI to to manipulate to AI hallucinations. Like what happens if your psychotherapy chatbot hallucinates uh, or, or or says uh, the, the 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 famous uh, story of Sydney, the AI chatbot. If you know, don't don't leave your wife. But maybe you know, maybe you're right. Maybe your life isn't really contributing anything to society, and maybe maybe the world would be better off without you, Dave. Uh, right. The, the, there are dangers here, um, and they don't, it doesn't take much imagination to to hypothesize them. Okay, so so we have I don't have to tell this group, but we've been having a societal conversation um, for the last I would say five to eight years about big data, and the last two years about AI. Um, and if you've grabbed a random person on the street or a random legislator in a legislative chamber or in their offices or fundraiser, wh wherever they spend their time. Um, usually not on the, on the floor of the legislature. Uh, and you ask them about, about AI solutions, they would say, oh, it's great, you know, we really want to work on bias and we want to we wanna be sure that people consent to the uses of AI. We've got a series of, of strategies that we've used to deal with these, these problems, but these problems are real. What we want to suggest is the existing strategies, and let's, let's pick four of them. These are existing harms, and an existing solutions to those harms. Transparency, bias mitigation, AI ethics. I noticed on the opening slide there's a little AI ethics medallion. And individual rights. I, I signed a consent form before I gave my talk, right? Consent, property rights, participation, um, informed consent. Um, we have these strategies. And, and what we want to say, I, I want to be crystal clear about what we are maintaining. 
we are not saying that we're going to be very critical of these strategies. We're not saying that AI should not be transparent or we shouldn't mitigate bias or that we shouldn't develop AI ethics or that we shouldn't, we might be saying we shouldn't develop individual rights and more on that in a moment. What, what we are saying though is that the solutions, the, the, the problems we have conceptualized, that we have identified, that we've articulated in the public debate around AI in general and biomedical AI in particular are real. And the solutions that we have offered for them are in good faith, but that even if we do all of these things, it will not be enough. It will not be remotely enough. So let me, let me talk a little bit about this. So well, that, was, that was Woody testifying uh, on, on precisely this point before the Senate last month. Transparency. Um, it is good to the extent that we can to make complex socio-technological systems, particularly in the health context, transparent to the patients, to the users, to the human beings who encounter them. However, just being able, even if we can solve the problems of technological opacity, particularly with machine learning, where the d designers of systems say, I don't know how it does what it does, it just, it just does it. Um, even if we can solve that technical problem, which is serious, um, transparency does not automatically make things right when things go wrong, right? Just being able to see into something and know how bad it is um, doesn't solve the problem. Just like for a physician, diagnosing a disease is not the same as treating a disease, much less curing a disease. Okay, bias mitigation. AI bias is well documented, it is real, it is a tremendously significant problem that we need to solve and that we need to do better at solving than we have up to this point. At some point though, it might be that because AI models, learning models certainly, um, rest upon insights from data, data comes from the world, the world is biased, data reflects the world, the AI might be irredeemably and irretrievably biased. But even if we can solve that problem, creating systems that treat people equally doesn't solve the problem of if they're harmful because then they can harm people equally. I imagine um, a, a political misinformation machine that is just, it's just not really doing a good job with the Latino community. Um, we could solve the problem for bias here by, by making it better and sort of manipulating everybody, but then we actually have a worse problem than we had to start with. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't address bias so we can solve these problems, but, but even if we do make uh, our technologies bias-free, they still do whatever they do equally to everyone, and if what they do is problematic, then bias mitigation alone will not be enough. And I, and I, I worry, we worry, that bias mitigation proposals in particular are a problematic half measure because they create the illusion by solving a real problem on the parts of firms and entities developing these technologies that the problem itself has been solved when really only one of the underlying problems has been solved. Similarly too, when it comes to, so we're, we're, we're lawyers, when it comes to legislative proposals, bias mitigation and transparency in particular, well, we'll make AI, F can give regulators the, the illusion they've done something that they've solved the problem and then move on to other problems that demand their attention when just being able to see into systems and making sure they don't discriminate is only part of the problem. So we worry, again, bias is real, we should solve it. Uh, we, we do not mean to diminish or denigrate you know, any of the, the tremendous body of work that we cited in the paper that, uh, in our, in, and in our testimony um, that, you know, a generation of scholars from across disciplines in the academy has worked on to document and try to solve these problems. Um, but from a policy perspective, um, we worry that a focus exclusively or even primarily upon bias would itself be a half measure. This brings us to AI ethics, and AI ethics are important. I wrote a paper 10 years ago called Big Data Ethics, right? Big Data was just the word we use then for AI. Um, 
AI ethics are really popular among profit-making entities. Well, we'll just create an ethics board. We'll get some, we'll get some nerds. We'll put them on the board. Um, I mean, if they tell us something we don't want to do, we just fire them, or, or we'll get good nerds next time. Or uh, right, the, the the problems with AI ethics boards, Google's ethics board in particular, has been well documented in the press, and I don't need to I don't need to go into that. Um, ethics offers uh, ethic again. AI ethics is important. We need to do better at developing it. We need to have it to inculcate an ethical sensibility among the designers of AI, among the users of AI. Um, I think the problem is less in the biomedical sphere than it is uh, in sort of the tech sphere broadly defined, but it is a problem that, that all applications and instantiations of AI are going to share. Um, but without enforcement, this is where our role as lawyers comes in, without rules that are binding, that are substantively limiting, um, AI ethics boards um, can can provide the illusion of a, of a philosophy seminar um, without the reality of meaningful constraining regulation that takes harmful practices off the table and deters them. Finally, with respect to individual rights, there's a lot of proposals. Well, if we if we have people own their data, that's going to be fine. Or if, we, or if we have people consent, we give them a consent form. Um, uh, we, many of us who are speakers ju just signed a consent form. Um, I'm a lawyer. I, I read the consent. It's, it, it's, it, it's a good consent form. Um, if you are a lawyer for Penn State, um, if you are a data subject, uh, as the person next to me said, who I will not name, um, does it allow them to make deep fake videos of you? And the answer is yes. Uh, uh, does it allow them to make pornographic deep fake videos of you? The answer is yes. Does it allow them to sell those videos? Yes, because commercial purposes is one of the things that we agreed to. Is I'm not, I'm not making fun of you, Jen, I promise. Uh, l lawyers are gonna do that. It's, it, it's on us, well, you're a lawyer too, but, but it, it's on us collectively. Um, it, it, my point is, notice and choice has been a catastrophic failure in the internet space. Informed consent is increasingly approaching the breaking point, if it hasn't already, in the medical space. And to double down upon these failed or failing technological tools for the brave new world of generative and diagnostic and other forms of AI in the biomedical sphere would be a disaster. We need to do better. So, how can we do better? Uh, and the, and the, uh, door number three um, is trustworthy AI. We need to build AI that is worthy of trust and that, is, and that becomes trusted because it is worthy of trust. And that requires us to move beyond half measures. It requires us um, to accept three propositions. First proposition is that AI is not neutral. Technologists will tell you, well, technology is neutral. It's just bad users. It's, 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 the, it's the pesky people. If we could only solve for people, um, we could have much better technological systems. Um, that's, that's literally true. Um, that's also, th as a sort of uh, nerdy middle-aged Englishman um, growing up in the 70s, this is the, the, the parable of the Cybermen in, in Doctor Who. If we replace all the biological parts in a system, um, we're going to have uh, rational uh, you know, uh, machines that solve all of these problems. The problem is when you do that, you abstract humanity and you, and you get things that are literally quite monstrous. AI is not neutral. AI is, like any technology, uh, they make certain things easier. They make certain things harder. They can have a differential uh, consequences for different people. Some people get to do things more easily. Some people get to do things with, with greater difficulty. Um, they can make things easier that we don't want to make easier. Um, ChatGPT, I, I was hoping not to use that phrase because people talk about it too much. ChatGPT, I have a, a son who's a senior in high school who's applying to colleges. Um, my, my, my poor daughter applied to colleges during the pandemic when everything was broken. Now my, our poor son is applying the first year that everybody else's essay is being written by generative AI. Um, Certainly in, in high school English classes, it's important for people to write their own essays to learn how to think and to communicate. AI makes that trivially easy, 
um, with real consequences, not just to academic integrity, but also to the development of essential skills that are necessary for people to be good students, good members of society, good self-governing democratic citizens who can think for themselves and think and think critically. But AI is is not new. We need to reject the argument that guns don't kill people, people kill people. That's true, but really people with guns kill people and, and guns make it a whole lot easier than than your fists. Okay, so second, we need to resist what we call the inevitability narrative. Well, well, Neil, AI is just coming. It's coming, and if we don't build it, the Chinese will, and so it's inevitable, so we just need to get with the program and put some guardrails in place. No. No, people are going to build AI or not. More fundamentally, though, AI, just as it is not a person, is not a monolith. There is no single, inevitable, evolutionary form of artificial intelligence that we are mo inevitably, inexorably moving towards. Artificial intelligence, like big data before it, like smartphones, like social networks, like the design of this campus, which made it very, very difficult for me to get here from the hotel because I got lost three times. Um, I'm having a lovely time, Jen, I promise. Um, all of these are human constructions that are the product of design choices. And design choices are made by people in organizations often, serving the purposes of those people and the goals of those organizations. And so something like artificial intelligence, something that we are going to call artificial intelligence, or actually probably multiple things that we're going to call artificial intelligence are going to get built. They're going to get built in our society. Yes, China will build some too, um, as will other countries. But the forms in which these technologies take their design and their deployment and their instantiation into our society and the rules governing their influencing their development and governing and influencing their deployment and their application are very much up for grabs. And that's where LC questions come in, that is where policy questions come in, um, that is where these sorts of conversations come in. Um, we have a range of choices before us as a society, and frankly as a civilization, um, and we need to at least first recognize that we do have choices. We're just not stuck with whatever Sam Altman's engineers build for us. Um, and third, most importantly, how do we bring these technologies in line with human values so that they are trustworthy and trusted, we need to have substantive interventions that limit abuses of power and build trust. Final point, there's, there's not a clock in this room, so I wanna be sure that, I'm, that I am staying on time. Um, that, that's a design choice, uh, to have a beautiful view of the Pennsylvania Hills, um, but, but not to have a clock. Um, and again, I, I'm, I'm not criticizing the design, well, I am criticizing the design of the building, but I'm not criticizing Jen. My, my, my point is, particularly in, in, a, in a building with the word design in its name, where design is taken seriously and design is conscious, right? To have the whiteboard is a choice, to have uh, the cameras is a choice, to have this gorgeous panoramic view, if they just knocked down the 1970s building, it would be even better, uh, is, is a choice. Um, Choices are what are going to determine whether we have meaningful trust, sustainable trust. Um, so, so what is trust? Trust we define in our academic work as the willingness to accept vulnerability to the actions of others. I have accepted vulnerability to Penn State making deep fake videos of me because I trust Jen and I trust the larger infrastructure of the Penn State ethic of um, academic integrity and, and uh, to, to use a word I'll, I'll, I'll mention later, beneficence um, to, towards me. Um, trust is the essential ingredient, uh, uh, ingredient for the development of, of AI and the, and the building and deployment and investment of responsible biomedical AI. It builds on, on work that Woody and I have, have done in the, sort of the, the, in the digital pre-AI context on on trust, um, but think about the patient-physician relationship, right, which is one that is trusted and which information flows freely, in most cases, between the patient and the physician. And, and trust shows that 
when we're talking about data-driven technologies, it, we don't want to focus on data. We want to focus on relationships because ultimately, people won't trust technology. People won't use technologies that they don't trust. Four ways to get to trust. First, four principles I think um, that that we can that we can deploy to ensure trustworthy technologies, we can ensure trustworthy AI, and we can ensure trustworthy and responsible biomedical AI. These can come from, let me be clear up front, these can come from professional rules, they can come from professional ethics. Um, I think physicians and biomedical researchers at, at research universities on the whole do a superb job um, and should be applauded for their commitment to trust building principles. Um, but as more and more of these technologies are built outside of universities and hospitals, uh, as more and more of these technologies are built in partnership with profit-making entities, as more and more of these technologies are just sort of, you know, dropped into these environments, it's important to articulate these principles, which are implicit to, to you know, people who've grown up the generation and generations influenced by, by the Belmont Report and, and biomedical ethics more broadly, and to make some of them explicit. Uh, first is protection. Uh, you should protect the people who are vulnerable, um, that you that you make vulnerable through your technologies. And and as someone who grew up in the north of England, in the sort of the the rusty remnants of the industrial revolution, we have some lessons we can draw from history here. Industry standards did not work for child labor in factories, in the Lowell Mills, in Sheffield, in Manchester, uh, and in places around the world today. Um, just because other, as, as my, my mother-in-law who lives about 100 miles from here says, if everybody jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge, would you too? A, a similar uh, Peg's, Peggy's critique applies to um, uh, industry standards. They, they are not, if the industry standards are not good, um, they're not gonna be sufficiently protective of the vulnerable people who are exposed to these technologies. So protection solves the risky problem um, by, by making sure through a variety of mechanisms we can talk about in the Q&A, that people are protected, that you know, first do no harm, um, we can mitigate some of, some of the, the, the problems of, of riskiness. Second principle is discretion. Um, HIPAA is the legal rule, and I, here I mean the actual HIPAA with, with one P, not two, and the one that is the product of uh, careful regulations on privacy and security developed by the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Health and Human Services and not whatever your aunt thinks should happen with her vaccine rights, um, like actual, actual HIPAA, um, is developed to provide discretion. Information flows within the physician-patient relationship. It flows within the hospital to allow healthcare operations to function. It flows, because this is the United States, to insurance companies so that bills can get paid but it doesn't flow any further unless the, the rigorous requirements of the research procedures in HIPAA are followed, or the onerous burden of an individual healthcare authorization is sought and obtained. So HIPAA is discrete. Problem is, as I don't have to tell anybody in this room, um, HIPAA is great for uh, if, if one of us falls down the stairs and goes to Penn State Hospital um, and gets treated, um, but doesn't apply to the to the Apple Watch that is on my wrist, to my web searches, to to a whole variety of technologies, including a lot of the AI health technologies which are being developed outside of the scope of an insurance-funded doctor-patient healthcare transaction. Think about the Amazon Alexa, which is appearing everywhere sometimes in hotel rooms, often in intimate spaces. This is an actual, this is not my wife, this is an actual uh, ad that Amazon has pl placed for the Echo, when it f or the Alexa, I guess it's called now, when it, when it first came out. People are talking to their IoT devices. I noticed there was an IoT lab uh, right by the entrance to this, to this building. Um, they're using uh, IoT devices, including the Alexa uh, for health and fitness. They are talking and creating uh, information about them uh, with, with the data, uh, w with the voice interface. Um, there are, beyond IoT, there are apps and other forms of technologies that people use to monitor their health. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of discussion in, in our post-Dobbs environment about um, uh, period tracking apps and the so-called, it's a horrible term, femtech industry. Um, 
Uh, and of course, data surrounding access to, to health data, access to reproductive services, location data is all falling outside the scope of HIPAA. We have an old principle in our culture and in our law to deal with, which is the notion of confidentiality, right? The, the, the priest in the confessional, um, more in more modern groups, the, the ethic of, of confidentiality surrounding um, mental health and substance abuse treatments, doctor-patient ethics. And, and, and why is this the case? Because when we think about privacy, this is what my, my last book, which Jen mentioned earlier, is about. Privacy is not about, as a lot of the physicians I've talked to in my career uh, and as a patient um, think, uh, idiosyncratic, heter heterogeneous preferences of weird patients. Um, people are concerned about their health data because privacy is about information about people, and information is power, and information about people confers power over those people. This is why blackmail is a felony. And privacy rules should serve human values, including, as relevant here, building trust. And so broadening protections for confidentiality secures discretion, and discretion solves the leaky problem. Third, uh, honesty. It's important for the builders of technologies, including biomedical AI, to be honest about what their technologies do, to be, as, as the Georgetown privacy scholar Paul Ohm calls it, to be forthright rather than to bury disclosures in, in terms and conditions, right? whether they are the ones in our health app or the ones that we are sort of thrust to us before we go for a, for a colonoscopy or a more serious medical procedure. Um, what we have in mind, rather than people just blindly signing things they didn't read and didn't understand um, is a shift in obligation from burying it in the fine print and putting the burden upon the patient or the consumer, depending on what kind of biomedical products we're talking about, shifting the obligation of the person understanding what's going on from the vulnerable person reading the fine print to understand and placing that obligation on the powerful developer and deployer of these technologies to be understood. It flips the responsibility. And, and if we do that, we find that honesty solves the sneaky problem, even though I kind of like that robot. Um, okay, finally, uh, loyalty. Um, very often it seems that AI technology, AI developers are just hungry for our data, hungry to use it in whatever purposes um, they, can, they can get it for. Um, loyalty is the promise that the powerful entities that are using our data in the health sector ostensibly to help us be healthy and help us to flourish have our backs. That they, they are putting um, their short-term interests ahead, they're putting our short-term interests ahead of their short-term interests. Of course, in the long run, in, like, in a doctor-patient relationship, information flows, everybody is better off. The doctor, the patient, the hospital, um, the developer of of, of devices. Loyalty ensures that we are not manipulated, that we are not puppets on this, this is Mark Zuckerberg, that we are not uh, puppets on a string dangling from the fingers of the people behind these technologies, um, that we are able to exercise some meaningful form of agency and make choices secure in the knowledge that we are going to be protected by whatever we will be protected whatever we happen to to choose. And so we, Woody and I have written quite a lot about uh, data loyalty in about seven or eight papers. Loyalty solves the hungry problem, a, a notion in data privacy law called data minimization, um, only collect what you need, um, can help solve the hungry problem, but loyalty is more powerful even than the four problems that I've outlined. Loyalty solves other problems as well and gets us towards, um, I think, um, this notion of, uh, of, of, a, of a helpful, responsible biomedical AI systems. Um, physicians already know this, right? HIPAA creates a duty of loyalty implicitly through its structure rather than explicitly. Happy to talk about that more in, in the Q&A. Um, but of course, HIPAA doesn't cover nearly enough health data to be a robust duty of loyalty for this entire sector. But as I said before, physicians and biomedical researchers already have an intuitive sense of loyalty. I think there's a, there's a significant overlap between loyalty and the beneficence principle 
in biomedical ethics. Um, physicians in particular have long enjoyed a fiduci fiduciary duty of loyalty towards their patients. And I think that gives me hope for responsible biomedical AI because unlike in the sort of the Silicon Valley tech sector writ large, um, in this corner of digital technology development, um, the ethical infrastructure is already in place at a nascent level. And what we need to do is to extend those protections through professional ethics, through contracts, through legal regulation as necessary to be sure that the loyalty we come to unquestionably expect when we go to visit our human physician is going to continue to be extended across the whole range of, of AI, cybernetic, mixed, human technological healthcare interfaces and socio-technical systems. Um, and so that's what I think we should do to build trust in biomedical AI. Questions? Oh. Uh, I'm curious about the bit where you focus particularly on short-term problems, and I'm curious as to whether that's because you think the issues are the same for long-term problems, or because you think tensions arise once we start taking into account long-term interests in the context of loyalty, and if so, what do we do with those oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I wanted to finish to leave time for questions. Um, I, I have, as, as you pointed out, I have a lot to say about loyalty, uh, as, as does Woody. Um, I, I think... Let me, let me say a little more fully what, what, what I'd have said um, if I had a little more time, is that this works for lawyers as well as doctors, but you, you have a problem, you go and see a professional. Um, that professional needs to know information about you in order to solve your problem, wh whether it's a, a speeding ticket uh, or a murder that they wanna help you uh, resolve outstanding legal liability for, um, or whether it is a, uh, a sort of marginal or serious healthcare problem that you are, that you are suffering. Um, wh when you go to the doctor, um, you, you go in there, and, and particularly if like I think many of us you know, work at universities, there's, there's often a tremendous but big university healthcare system. You go, take off all your clothes apart from your socks, you put on the backless gown, you stand there, you've never met the doctor. Um, uh, they come in, uh, you say, I've got a rash, and it's right here, and, um, and you tell them the information, you share it with them, because they, they need it to treat you, you know they need it to treat you, you know that they're not, you hope, they're not going to be gossiping about you in the, the physician's cafeteria that day when they talk to their friends. In the short term, the doctor, this goes to your question, in the short term, the doctor maybe could make some more money. Lawyers certainly can make some more money by trading on client secrets. Um, but they don't do it because the long-term interests of both the patient and the physician, of both the client and the lawyer, and I think also the user and the developer or deployer of, of, of biomedical AI are served by these long-term relationships. And so, so I didn't mean to bifurcate short-term versus long-term in that sense. I think long-term relationships here are the answer, the kind that we have with lawyers, the kind that we have with doctors, the kind we have with, with partners and, and spouses. Um, but in all of those relationships where there is loyalty, um, there are all inevitably things you could do, small acts of betrayal that could gain you a short-term benefit um, at the expense of the, of the integrity of the longer-term relationship. Um, and, and that's what I was trying to get at, is it's this, uh, this idea that um, in a loyal relationship, we realize the value is in the long term. And we forego short term um, benefits, like the old marshmallow test from the 1970s, right? We don't eat the marshmallow um, because we get, two, we get two marshmallows at the end of the session. Um, I think this idea of delayed gratification in these relationships is something that is important. And, and, and we see that, so this is less about the, the complexity of long-term problems and more the problem of short-termism. We see the problems with short-termism. Um, the examples are, Silicon Valley is replete with, with examples of, of this, this form. And law plays a role here by encouraging to be first to market, by encouraging firms 
to get to the IPO, um, this idea of a, of a data grab, minimum viable product, and then you cash out and you, it used to be you'd buy your Tesla, but more people have Teslas now. Um, but you, you know, you get your, your first million. Um, this, this short term venture capital driven, um, innovation culture, I think is harmful to the kind of long-term human values and long-term human flourishing. And I think we should, we should place incentives on entities to think more to the long-term rather than to make a quick buck or to engage in the, in the digital equivalent of, of strip mining or of uh, rapacious destocking of fish populations. Did that answer the question? That, or were you getting at something else? Well, we can talk, we can talk later. Okay, yes. Yes, sorry. I, I was just curious what those kinds of incentives are, do you think, would be sort of because, you know, there's a profit incentives, very proximate, mm -hmm. I mean, and that it drives some sort of things. So what would you see that would be sufficiently, you know, compelling to replace that profit incentive for them to think long term? So Kristen asked a great question, which is, okay, so, so how do we do that? How do we build the appropriate long-term incentives? I, I think the way to do it is to take the short-term cash outs off the table. Um, so, uh, lawyers and doctors again provide a great example, right? They're, they're highly regulated professions who owe fiduciary duties to their clients and patients. You cannot sell patient secrets or client secrets under, under the norms of ethics or under the governing legal regimes um, that apply to these professions. Um, we, we use law to make illegal the bad thing. Um, and I think we can do something similar in in artificial intelligence. Um, I, I think so. Those are for the for the sort of short term cash outs. I think more generally, um, I am worried. We are worried about the the incentives that corporate law places upon um, a, a phrase I hate to use, but I know is 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 used by people. The the innovation ecosystem. I mean, ugh. Um, but but that's what people say. Um, the incentives are you you want to get first to market. We, we may not be able to solve that problem, but you want to be first to IPO, creates incentives to build leaky, creaky, risky systems um, that, that cause unnecessary harm. The old, I went to Facebook uh, in the early days before the IPO, and there were signs up everywhere that said, hack and move fast and break things. We want to use our law to make sure the incentives to break things or to disregard the breakage of things, to bear the costs that are incurred, right? you break it, you buy it, are placed upon these systems. Th there's another problem, I think, as well, that also comes from corporate law beyond the sort of the incentives placed on venture capital-backed information technology startups. And this is the quarterly profits problem um, that, that uh, publicly traded companies have a huge incentive to make sure the balance sheets are good for the next three months and then they're done and then they start again e every three months and so there have been some proposals I'm not a corporate lawyer but there have been some proposals in corporate law to lengthen the reporting cycle um, to try to to remove some of the avoidable external incentives placed upon entities um, unfortunately right these are complex systems that uh, we've already talked about Privacy law, fiduciaries law, healthcare law, uh, corporate law. Um, we could add environmental law, right? There's there's multiple bodies of law and professional ethics that can we can bring to bear. But ultimately, right, we have to realize the healthcare system that we have has taken decades, if not hundreds of years, to reach the form it has, doing the good things that it does. And one of the challenges here, we are we are building this from scratch. With, with biomedical AI, but we need to be sure that we build the ethical guardrails at the same time. Not just because it's a good thing to do, but because if we really believe in the long, this goes to Nicholson's question, in the long-term potential of many of these technologies, it's important for us to, to, de to build them and to deploy them in a way that is sustainable. And I think uh, having the, the ethical, legal, and social protections that build trust and, and, and loyalty, I think, is the most important of those um, are, are really essential for us to do that.